Okay, so with uh, just before we we have a, a comfort break a bit later on, we're, we're going to invite um, Sophie Thorogood from Pelsis, our sponsors today, and we're talking about moths. And I'm going to say it properly: mini menaces, menaces, menaces. That is what it. Is. That's how you say it. Why can't I say that word today, Sophie? Yeah, I don't know why it sounds so complicated, but yeah, mini menaces because mini menaces. I mini menaces. Two words together. <laughs> yeah, I tried to go for a nice alliteration, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes so, so moths good. and their management is what, what we're talking about yes, today, I yes. think, isn't it? Yes, that's um, I do have a question. Sorry, George, I know you probably just relaxed, um, but you can just answer it in the chat. But I wondered, what kind of birds are we actually seeing the mosquitoes liking to feed on the most? Like, is there any particular bird species that we associate with, like, being really good uh, vector hosts? Um, but, yeah, answer it in the chat if, you, if oh, you're just we relaxing. Go. Popping up. George, you can answer now if you want, George. We've got a couple of minutes left on your session, session technically. Um, sure, yeah. Is that okay? So, yeah, 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 go for it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm not an ornithologist either, um, <laughs> but um, we, there are definitely certain birds that tend to tend to be preferred by certain species, but also there are certainly birds that uh, support um, virus transmission much better than other species. So particularly blackbirds um, are really good uh, hosts for certain viruses like West Nile virus. Um, you'll get sparrows and and uh, kind of corvids like crows and magpies in particular, which are, uh, which you often find infected with these viruses. Um, but mosquitoes, I think, are often, I actually don't know too much about the individual feeding preferences of different species, but um, often they prefer these kind of perching birds and they often target them when, they, when they're when they nesting. So the, the baby birds tend to get um, infected quite early on. If, mm. Yeah, I don't know if that... Yeah, that's really interesting yeah. actually because some of those birds you know we, we come across in pest control occasionally and they might be roosting actually near humans so that's actually quite interesting mm -hmm. to see like maybe we encourage mosquitoes nearby us as well that mm. is really interesting yeah yeah mm. okay great well thank you um, <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> Right, let me just uh, share my yeah, screen. Yeah, great. Listen, Sophie, I'll, um, I'll, 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 leave, I'll leave you to it and tell us a bit about moths. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Hopefully I have just shared it and you can see all of this. Okay, so thank you for joining today. Um, I like to talk about insects as well, but I'm going to talk about moths today. Um, I, I'm, I picked this topic because... Uh, we mainly think about moths, and I'm, I'm going to focus on our food moths, so our SPIs, our store product insect moths. Um, we mainly think about these in these big food factories um, and big production lines and mills and all sorts of things. But actually, there's some places where I go and they, you're storing food in warehouses. And um, because there's food there, there's always this risk that you could get these types of moths. So that's why I decided to focus on them. Um, moths, I'm going to do a little bit of background on moths. So moths belong to Lepidoptera, which is our second biggest order of insects. Um, so in that order, we have moths and butterflies. Um, they're both very similar. Um, there are some key differences. Um, so usually uh, moths are a bit more fluffy, I'd say. Um, when they hold their wings, they normally uh, hold them like kind of horizontally. Whereas if you look at a butterfly, they tend to like to hold their wings more vertically. Um, there's no like key differences between a moth and a butterfly, but general behavior and general like how they respond is that, you know, butterflies are more present during the day. They don't really fly at night like moths do, whereas moths can fly both during the day and during the night. Um, and generally we think of moths being a bit more brown and like drab in color. Um, but actually, you can get very beautiful, colourful moths, just like this elephant hawk moth, which is a personal favourite of mine. Um, I actually found this a couple of years ago. It, I think it was June time, and it, it's very bright pink, and it's got this nice green pattern as well with it. Um, and you can also get very uh, drab-looking butterflies. They, we often associate butterflies being really brightly coloured, but you can actually get some more brownish colours that aren't so like visually stimulating. Okay. So yeah, um, second biggest order, the only other bigger insect order are the beetles, the Coleoptera, and that's because there's so many thousands of beetles out there, um, but butterflies and moths come in afterwards. Um, and actually, I'd say like 80% are, are moths and only a very small percentage are butterflies in that order. Um, 
we get this name Lepidoptera from Latin. So when you look at it and just break it down, we've got Lepidos, which means scale, and Tera, or P-T-E-R-A, meaning wing. So we've got this scaled wing. And actually those scales cover the whole body of the insect. And that's what gives this morphal butterfly the beautiful colors and patterns we see. Um, when we talk about some of the moths later, the store product moths, sometimes they don't have all their scales anymore. And that's because they do lose them over time. And then find it, uh, identifying them can be very difficult because they've actually lost their distinctive pattern. And they're just kind of like a kind of grayish color. And that's when you get like, they can almost produce like a dust sometimes if you ever get close to moths, like you get this like dust appearing off them and that's the scales coming off. Okay. So we have to talk about the life cycle, of course, if we're talking about insects. Um, and for moths, it's actually really useful to know about this um, because it'll help your management. So we have this complete life cycle and I like to talk about it. They have like this complete change in what they look like from when they're growing as a larva to when they are this adult that is flying around. So we've got egg, larva, pupa, adult. Sometimes you can see it as cocoon, but I much prefer the terminology pupa. Um, and that immature stage or that growing stage, that larva or like caterpillar form, sometimes we use, um, they, we say they move differently. So they're crawling, but usually the adults are flying. Sometimes they don't fly very well, but they usually flutter around. They'll feed differently. So it's a lot of our pest moths we talk about, they don't actually feed at all when they're an adult. They just don't spend any time devoted to eating. Uh, they just actually spend all that time mating and trying to find uh, uh, somewhere to lay eggs. Uh, so that's really interesting when you're thinking about what's causing your damage to your food. It's not going to be the adults ever. You have to find the larvae and actually get rid of them to be, have successful management. Okay. And so they, they pose different pest risks. I mean, the adults will still be laying eggs around the food source, but it is the larvae that are causing the damage. Okay. And so we need to treat them differently. We need to think about targeting both the adults and the larvae. Now, when we look at an adult moth, this is my example. Um, so a lot of the times you'll see the moths splayed out like this for identification. But when you actually see moths, um, then usually fold their wings over the back of their abdomen um, and that's how we, we sort of normally see them. So you don't actually often see that hind wing, that wing underneath, because it's tucked underneath the fore wing when they're at rest. Uh, we also have this thorax in the middle. Uh, that This middle part of the insect, that's where the, the wings and the legs are attached to. So it's actually got quite a lot of muscle there. Um, we've got our abdomen. This is kind of, I'd say, it's where you, you get like the squishier part of the insect. It's not very terminology correct, I know, but it's more where you get like the organs of the insect. Uh, they don't have proper organs like we'd find in uh, a mammal, so distinctive organ parts, but they do have some rudimentary types of organs that, you know, for digestion or for reproduction, that, that will be there. Uh, we've got that head part, of course. And on that head, we have two sensing organs. So we have the antenna, which are these long filament uh, sections, so these very long ones. Um, and we also have labial palps at the front of the mouth, well, just under, around the mouth area. Uh, they're not actually attached to the mouth, they're separate. Um, but they both sense uh, food, pheromones, that sort of thing in the environment, okay? So that's our, our adult moth. And then our larval moth, so it's a typical larvae. Um, again, we still can label these different features, but they look very different. So we still have this abdomen uh, of the insect. We still got a thorax, and that's where you can see the legs nearby, these six legs at the beginning, at the front of the insect. So again, they still have six legs, um, all insects do. And this is at the larval stage and at the adult stage, they'll have six legs. Uh, again, you can see that head part. And they have like some strong mandibles there for chewing lots of different food. They can actually chew through plastic occasionally. Um, and we also call these legs true legs. Um, that's because they also have these kind of extra um, 
carts, uh, extra, they're not proper legs. Um, they, they assist in the movement, but we don't actually count them as legs because they don't have the same feature um, as a proper leg. Um, so they, they help with the assessment of uh, the, the larva because they actually, you know, they're quite long, so they have to make sure they can move easily. Okay. So those are our adults and larvae. And I pick moths because over Christmas, we actually had a lot of it, a uh, lot of uh, moth contamination. Uh, so I don't know if you heard about it in the news, but we had stuffing, which had uh, moths in it. We also had some biscuits that had moth larvae in. Um, so it's affecting consumers, the general public, um, uh, the moth problem in the UK at the moment. Um, we think like by the time you've prepared the food, packaged it, transported it, we would have all these checks along the way that we make sure that no moths end up in, you know, your stuffing that you buy in the supermarket. Um, but it just shows how e how hard they are to detect and how hard they are to manage. Okay. But yeah, usually we think about these big manufacturing facilities where you're creating large amounts of food or you're storing a lot of food. Um. SPIs, so store product insects, we control them for a few reasons. So one, if we don't control them, we're losing our commodity over time. They're going to be eating the food, taking it away, and we're going to basically be wasting time in growing it, harvesting it, etc. We can also use lose our product quality. So you can end up it not tasting as nice, uh, it not being nutritionally as as good as it was before because the moths have actually taken that nutrition away from the food. Sometimes it can be downgraded, so it's no longer fit for human consumption. And that leads to whoever's been producing that food being able to make less money out of that food uh, because animal feed is usually uh, less expensive um, to actually sell. So you, you basically wasted time and money on producing something that's for humans only for it to be only sold for animals instead. Uh, lots of nutritional value. Like I said already, you could lose actual nutrition from the food. Uh, we could also get mold growth. Um, they raise the humidity. If you get an infestation of insects uh, in your food, so we've got moths and beetles, you could have weevils as well. I know they're a type of beetle, but uh, you could get lots of different insects that are living in our food. And when they're there, they produce um moisture and it actually raises the humidity of your food being stored then you can get mold growing you can get other insects turning up to feed on the mold but you can also get toxic mold being grown that actually would have ill again be bad for your health if you ate that um, we also have to worry about the insects being in the food in terms of you've got their bodies, uh, you've got like parts of them, you've got um, frass, so the webbing they produce with the feces inside as well. We've got what we no one wants to eat that. It wouldn't necessarily make you that ill, but no one wants to eat that. Um, but sometimes people do have allergic reactions to these uh, parts of the, the moth on all their feces. Um, so we've got to be wary of that. And yeah, so most importantly, we're wasting our time in growing, harvesting, processing, transporting and storing our food. OK, and by the time it gets to that supermarket, that's when that product has cost you so the most amount because you've spent every single step of the way. You spent lots of time and effort making sure you've doing the uh, to produce it. OK, so when you get that last stage, that's when you're going to have the most loss because actually you've wasted so many times, so much time beforehand. OK, and I like this picture because you can see the moth larvae. Here they are. And you can see the webbing they have created. All moths will produce this silk, this webbing. And it's a very distinctive sign that you have moths. Um, so it's really good to look out for them. If you can't find them yourself, because, you know, they are usually very well camouflaged for the food they're eating. They're not brightly coloured, the, the pest moths we talk about. Uh, look for the webbing as well, because actually that's a nice sign that you have them and they, it, they leave it behind. So 
The first one I'm going to talk about is the Indian meal moth, or called Clodia interpunctella. Okay, uh, probably the most uh, prevalent moth species around the world that infests our food. Um, it's done amazingly well, and you find it in many different countries in many different types of food. It's very distinctive, the colouring. Well, it's the most distinctive, I say, of all the pest moths. So you've got this like reddish brown pattern on the bottom half of the wings. Um, and the rest of it's kind of like this grayish brown. The larva, here he is, right next to the adult, is normally white, could be yellow, could be more red. Depends what they're eating. They can actually change colour depending on the food. Um, we've got things like stored cereals, nuts, dried fruit, oil seeds, oil cakes. Uh, basically, it could survive on almost anything, given the opportunity. It can also bite through plastic and cardboard. So uh, if you see very small holes, it's due to the larvae where they've punched a hole through it, either to gain access into the food or maybe to leave the food after they've eaten enough to actually crawl away and migrate somewhere to where they can pupate safely. Uh, sometimes you do get larvae eating other larvae. So you, sometimes they will actually crawl away many hours to pupate in a different location. And they tend to like to wander upwards, uh, somewhere nice and dark. Um, so it's always good to look up. Um, you can look at ceilings, but I also think under the machinery. Think about under surfaces. Um, have a really good inspection under those because you might find the pupa they're stuck on. Okay. Oh, and they love cardboard packaging to actually pupate into. Uh, when I used to keep them, we'd have a uh, corrugated cardboard, um, and in each little corrugation, you'd find a single pupa. So they love to be in this like dry surface where they can feel nice and safe and nice and dark. Okay. The next one we've got is the Mediterranean flower moth. Okay, called Ephesia cunelia, or however you want to say it. Uh, this one's more like a greyish uh, pattern with some black mottling on it, okay? You can just about see like this black zigzag across the wings. Okay. Um, they tend to be a little bit bigger than the Indian mill moth or Plodia. So we've got 10 to 14 millimetres long. Again, here's the larvae, with a creamy kind of coloured, but they can be more pink, more green, depending on what they eat. Again, was producing silk. All the all the moth larvae will produce silk, um, and that helps them to protect themselves. They might spin it around themselves, and it will help when they're moving around. Uh, mainly attacking flower, but we also have them attacking nuts, animal feed, biscuits, uh, beans as well. Um, lots of different food, dried fruit, um, lots of different things available. We find that they generally like to rest during the day. And then just when the light is going down and when it's becoming dusk, that's when they will take flight. And that's when they start to mate. So they'll take flight um, and it's kind of like peak in activity you can actually map. Um, and it becomes very much like just where, just when it gets a little bit darker, that's when they like to actually take flight. When you have 24 hour uh, operation so you may not see that big hive of activity because actually they they kind of lose this time of when actually it is day and when it's night so you might still see more more ha more uh, flying or fluttering of the moths around dust time but it, you'll get more peaks during the day because they they don't know when exactly is the right time uh, again the adults don't feed this one might take a little bit of water um, but as an adult, they just spend most of the time trying to find another mate. Okay. Uh, you can also find this one on, on your insect light traps or your fly killers. Uh, this is one of the ones that you will actually see appear on the board because they quite like UV light. I've got one more to talk through, and that is our tobacco or chocolate moth. Okay. So Ephestia elutella. There are other types of Ephestia moths. So there's also an almond moth. Ephestia cortella um but you can see like this pattern 
this grayish brown grayish pattern with like the black banding it's quite distinctive in the tobacco or chocolate moth where you get this like strong line and then this other kind of zigzag line at the bottom of the wings um but again when they lose the scales it's actually quite difficult to tell different ephestia apart from each other so you want like a nice fresh moth uh, so this one's around 16 millimetres long. We also have the almond moth, which this one does get confused with quite easily. Uh, we have eggs deposited singly or in small batches on the food. And that's common for most moths that they'll actually lay their eggs right near the food so that when the larvae hatch out, they have their food source right there. It's very easy for them. And as the name suggests, they do like tobacco. Uh, tobacco industry is still going strong in many other parts of the world and if you had your tobacco moth or your tobacco beetle there's also lasioderma um, you can get your stored tobacco basically losing its flavor having to you have to discard it again because you can't sell it anymore because you've got it contaminated with insects um, and when you get moths like that in that sort of uh, area you have to do uh, a lot of uh, of course monitoring um, but you have to lean on things like co2 treatment or phosphine treatment to actually kill the moss within these massive stacks of tobacco okay so those are the main moss i'm going to be talking about there are a couple more that occasionally come into our the pest world and our food um, but i say most of the times if you ever came across uh moths in food it would be either plodia or your indian meal moth or your festia because uh, those are the ones that do really really well okay. when you're looking for moths here are some signs so here we've got a moth larva and you can see that silk it's created this is actually where the packaging has been sealed at the bottom and often that might be a really good place to look and so if you like open up like trying to peel back the plastic and look at that seam where it's joined. You might see some moths there. Here you can see some frass. So this like is that webbing with food particles that like dropped out of the larva's mouth and they've been eating along with their, their feces and it all gets like wrapped up together. It's quite um, grainy, you can feel some of it. If you get that, it can actually clog a lot of machinery because it can't move correctly. And then you get, you might get, system failures as well and here's like it's kind of splayed out on a table but it's like it does all clump together and you can just pick it up and in there you also might find the larvae you might find eggs um you could find a couple of adults but usually they would actually be flying or fluttering somewhere else and then here is a moth pupa so they do spin the silk to create that pupa case and then what happens in there is that they basically break down their whole body and then build it back up into their adult form. It's quite amazing that they can do that. Okay. Other signs of moths. So here we've got again edging. So it's great to look at the back of things or where you have uh, something meeting. So uh, like the edge meeting horizontal surface because they like to build their pupa case there. Here we did have one and something's happened to it. It's gone off. Um, here we've got lots of larvae in a, it was like a discarded bucket. They have got some moisture in there as well. Um, but that's quite common that people do a lot of cleaning, a lot of inspecting, and then they are over often overlook one thing and in there you get all your moths because people forget to bin stuff and that's where they end up. Here again, we've got a little pupa along the edge of some machinery. Um, so it's really good to get a bright colored torch. Um, I had it the other day where my torch needed new batteries. And as soon as I changed the batteries, I was like, wow, I'd, uh, I'd actually missed some stuff because uh, you need something really bright to illuminate these really dark spaces. So I can't believe how useful that is. Um, oh, and I have a little video. I'll just turn the mute off, good. So, I collected some frass from a place I went, and it's only a very small portion at that bottom of the jar. And out of that, God, I got so many different moths. Um, there's a good like 50 to 100 in there, uh, but it's only about from a very small amount of um, frass at the bottom. So you can see there, it's only around 
an inch deep, if that. Um, and yeah, I, I wanted to continue the infestation, but in the jar, but it's just too difficult at that point because there's too many of them. Yeah. Um, so where are you going to find them? Where Where's really good to inspect for moths? Uh, we've got uh, we've got our food stores and our ingredient stores. So here on the left, you know, people store food like this occasionally. It's really hard to inspect because you can't actually get around and look for the moths in those areas because there's lots of stuff in the way. It's always good to have it nice and clear so you can actually move around it and see damages in the packaging as well. Um, you won't be able to in that situation. So yeah, if there's spillages, it's not often maybe not cleared away promptly. Um, they leave it for extended period and then you get the moss feeding that on that food. Uh, also, you could get your infestation or moss being brought in from a supplier. So we often get some person producing the grain in one area, some person then uh, milling it, and then that flour goes onto your bakery. And so you get many stops along the way and someone could be bringing that in to that your bakery from your mill. Okay. People aren't sometimes also store quarantine goods, so they shouldn't be stored there. If you get an infestation, don't store it right next to your, your raw ingredients. You're just going to lead to that also being contaminated. So always make sure that's in a different area excluded from your, where your raw food is. Okay. We also have mixing rooms. So here you can see um, we get lots of different bits of machinery being used. And one of the key things is here, you can see this like uh, belt at the bottom, this wheel being rotated. And I found it sometimes that they just don't clean behind there. And you can just about see in that picture, but there was lots of food being stored uh, behind there that just wasn't being cleaned out. Um, you also get very much like empty spaces in equipment where the food accumulates over time, uh, lots of spillages. Sometimes you get damaged equipment and then that leads to more food being accumulated or more food actually being produced in those areas. Um, again, as well, I've seen it before where you have broken equipment just being stored there. They go, oh, it's broken. Oh, we'll get a new one but they don't bother being the old one. And so it just sits there in the corner, not being cleaned um, for, for many months, maybe even years, because they just never get around to actually binning it, even though they replace it with something new. Okay. Other areas go along the production line as well, of course. So we've got um, the slow moving machinery. Uh, usually they will end up having a buildup of food so that's always really useful to know, like, is it performing at the right rate it is it's supposed to be? Uh, the fitting of machinery as well. People clean, but they don't clean under or clean, clean underneath the fitting. Again, like if it's not properly sealed to the floor, you'll get a tiny gap. And that's where your moths could be. Um, any coverings of the machinery. So they might cover one section with plastic. And then when you start to actually peel it back and look underneath, you find the moths there. Um, the fabric of the room, so people don't clean above stuff. So here, this picture below, they don't worry, they put, a, they put a cockroach monitor down or an insect monitor, but they just had not been cleaning up, up here at all. And again, there was dust accumulating because when you've got these big mixing and production lines, you get like, um, food particles going up in the air and then settling in other areas, okay? It's really useful when you go around to actually look at all the machinery and you go, can I can I just look in there? And they go, oh, we've never opened that. But that's a really good sign that actually the moths might be there because if they've never opened it, they've never cleaned it, they've never looked inside, but the moths can get in very easily and get back out, okay? And of course, we do have our sites that vary quite substantially. So on the left, this is what we hope we get our food being produced in. Nice, clean areas, um, no damages, um, very easy to inspect for moths, uh, very easy to find them if they do ever turn up. But of course, we're not always going to have that situation. So here on the right, you can see lots of food being uh, basically building up. You can see the floor again, how are you going to clear all that? 
all the dirt out of every single floorboard there. Um, even the pipes taking the food from one place to the other. So taking the flour, they're not nice and smooth like this. There's going to be edges and, and uh, you're going to get bits of food building up along the way. So it's very difficult to actually uh, do a really good pest management program there with all that extra food around. Okay. So I will talk briefly about management. Um, I'm not going to focus typically on the insecticides because um, while insecticides are really useful, you would use things like maybe ultra low volume or um, space sprays to help reduce the moth burden. So actually kill off any moths and reduce them down. Um, but a lot of that you can't actually treat around the food. So you've got to be very much specific of what the site allows you to do. Um, and then you, if you're not allowed to use chemicals, then you get very specialized. So then you might do heat treatment and you need uh, big uh, heat machines, or you might do CO2 treatment, which is even more dangerous because you're then releasing carbon dioxide into the environment and making sure people stay safe while that is happening. Um, you can, of course, yeah, use your space sprays or so like ultra low volume, or you can spray walls if you had a, a large number in an area to kill off the adult moths. But you've got to be really careful that you don't contaminate any types of food in the area. OK, so when we do moth control, we inspect thoroughly. And that, again, I hope I've talked through, like looking at machines, uh, looking uh, right into very small areas, cracks and crevices, dark areas, things that have not been opened. Um, I mean, even here we had uh, a rat trap. And at the bottom, we've got pupa actually uh, underneath it. So yeah, locate breeding sites with monitors. So we have many different moth monitors available. Uh, if you find anything infested, remove it, bin it, get it out of the place, quarantine it straight away, okay? Because you'll find that you get some moths appearing off, but then there'll be more moth larvae in there that'll keep eating and eating. And so if you have, if you don't bin it straight away, you're gonna get more moths emerging and then laying eggs around the site. Okay. Uh, yeah, treat affected area of site standards and keep it clean. I know it's really hard when I when I say to keep it clean when we talk about this, but they're very small. They're mini menaces. They only need a very small amount of food to survive. So you've got to make sure you get rid of all that food as quickly as possible. So clean regularly and clean in detail. Uh, a lot of times you get cleaners coming around and doing like more almost like a superficial Clean, but they're not actually getting into underneath uh, exact points where you get the moths breeding or they might clean and then actually sweep it into an area and that's where the moths are as well okay and I will talk about monitors quickly so with monitoring uh, we have to first talk about moth reproduction because in our moth monitors we have the pheromone that the female produces to produce in the monitor to attract the males. Okay, so here on the left, you can see clearly this one's a female because what she's doing is she's extending her ovipositor and actually raising it up. Okay, she she is calling to the male moths. She's she's ready to mate. She's ready to produce eggs. So she's producing that pheromone, and the males will kind of fly upwind to find her. So. If they, if they can, they'll kind of follow her through the air to find where she's resting. When she's when she's found, they do a little courtship display. So they might rub antenna. Um, and then when, once it starts, it actually takes place usually three to four, five hours after dusk. So that's why dusk is important, because actually that's when they start finding each other and the males are searching for the females. In that pheromone, we know what it is. It's got this uh, chemical name. I like to call it Zeta. And that's a, a common name we use for it. Uh, but it's tetradecadinyl acetate. Um, and we have pheromones for moths because actually, you know, it sounds very complicated. They're very easy to produce synthetically. Um, beetle pheromones as well are quite easy to produce. Uh, but when you have pheromones for bed bugs, 
for cockroaches is a lot harder to make those uh, synthetically in a lab. Um, so that's why we've had moth pheromones and beetle pheromones for quite a while, but actually only recently we got a bed bug pheromone because it took a lot of research to actually produce it. Okay. And here you can see the moss actually mating. Um, there we are. Just okay. a quick three minute warning, Sophie, just so you've yeah, got yeah, just a couple of minutes left. Okay, all right. Sorry, I could talk about moss for ages. Um, so moth monitors are really useful because then you can actually identify when your infestation first starts. So when it's first being brought in. So great into your ingredient store, definitely have moth monitors there or anywhere you're storing your food because you want to make sure you know exactly when they turn up. Okay, but they can also be used to highlight where you have particular problems at the site. Uh, this is a, quite a nice heat map. So you can see peak activity in one certain area. And you can do this quite simply by just like drawing the site map and then recording the numbers. And you could color code it, I suppose, but you can actually visually see where the issue is and target your, your control first to that area. Also moths, if the temperatures are high enough in summer, they can migrate outside so they can fly from one building to the next. So even though if you have a moth problem in one building, it might end up affecting the other one in the future if you're not careful with your door closure and if you're not monitoring externally around the building. Okay. But yeah, don't put any, a monitor near lots of airflow. Uh, and that's because the moths might not be able to actually get to the monitor very easily. They do fly, but they're not the strongest of flyers, I'd say. So the airflow will affect your monitor. Okay. Uh, I really like this one. Uh, it's a stripy trap, so that's quite good. Moss-like uh, contrast, so black and white. And it, it works pretty well at catching moss. So here we've got a comparison of different uh, products in the market. I can't tell you which ones they are, um, but it caught uh, the most amount of moss in, in those days. Um, and they, you can hang them up in lots of different places. So that, that was quite good. And it comes with a sticky board inside already. We have a more durable one. So this one is the moth pot. Again, you've got that stripy pattern, which works really well, catching moths, attracting them to it. Um, and that one is a bit more durable, so you can use it in and outside, which is great if you're wondering about um, infestations coming from somewhere else. Again, you can get moth attraction from all angles because it's circular, um, can be put up high, you can put lures in it, and that, those lures will add like monitor for around 12 weeks okay also good for dusty environments so we've got that lid to it that's really useful uh of course dust gets onto the sticky boards and then it no longer is sticky or tacky enough to catch insects uh so with this one you definitely want to put a sticky liner inside um and you can buy those or you could use water detergent like a soapy mixture but the sticky board is really good because then you can do your moth mapping and do the counting of where your hotspots are. Okay. So that one's also really good. Um, other ones, you can get a small one to get underneath machinery. So that's good for both uh, beetles and moths because you can actually put it underneath. Um, and some moths don't fly very well, so they get stuck to the board still. Uh, but we can also use that pheromone in different ways, not just to attract males to the traps, but you can also use it to suppress the population and the principle is that if you put enough pheromone out a lot enough of that female sex pheromone the males find it really really tricky to find a fem an actual female moth because there's so much pheromone in the air they don't get a clear signal and so that's where you get dismate so that's a population suppression because the males can't find the females anymore or my personal favorite for using that mating disruption is the exosex. So this small blue unit, you can put a tablet of the pheromone in. Again, the males find this and then they pick up the dust on them or they pick up the pheromone on them and they smell like a female. So it, sm they, it again causes a lot of confusion in the moth population. And then you just end up with less eggs being laid because males and females can't find each other for mating so it's great at suppressing the population um but yeah that's me done i hope i didn't run over too much uh but that's uh my, my little intro into moths 
Great, thanks, Sophie. Yeah, I think like all of us, when we when we talk about a subject we're passionate about, yeah, we could just do it do it all day. And we're definitely one hundred percent listen to you for a lot longer. The time just flies, doesn't it? I don't know. What I know. It is. Just like moths do. <laughs> there we go. You caught on that one. That's that's great. Um, we we've got four questions in there. I'm not going to do all of them, but I'm just trying to look at one that might help the most people here and it's from susan so she says um in treating moths by knockdown methods it would would it be better doing this early evening as you'd be more likely to get adults on the wing definitely i think so so it's all about trying to get as many killed as possible so if you get high activity of the adults at that point it'd be great you can see a big return of like from dropping to the ground and then they'd be less available to continue mating there fabulous good um so in the in the Q and A bit, if you don't mind, like during the break or just after the break, when you come back, if you could type some of the um, I don't know why I did that for, but you know, I just thought I'd uh, show you how to do the typing. Uh, yeah. Some of the some of the answers to the questions that we we've had in the Q and A section. Are you good doing that? And then at least everybody will better get an answer to it. But yeah, I think people just want to get off and go and grab a coffee and 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 uh, have a comfort break. If that's okay. Is that good for yeah. you to do a Q and Q? Yeah, that? I'll do that now. Don't worry. Yeah. Fabulous. Great. Well, thank you so much again. That was honestly so, so interesting. And everyone's putting lots of comments saying um, thank you and, you know, for your deep explanations. So, yeah, again, thank you, Sophie. No problem. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care. Thank you.